Jesus talks about the generation, what does he actually mean? That's what we're going to talk about today in Luke 21. All right, so we're going to continue on to Luke 21, where we start off with the story of the widow who gave just two small copper coins. It was practically all she had. And the rich people who were putting these very extravagant gifts in the offering box. The idea is that the wealthy were giving amount, large amounts of money, but it didn't mean anything to them because they had lots more where that came from. It always makes me think of when you see, and nothing against people, but like Hollywood stars and they say, oh, well, this person donated $10,000 to blah, blah, blah. $10,000 is probably not very much money to them in the whole idea of charity, the charity is probably very excited to have the $10,000 and not the $5 from this person. But Jesus in his upside down kingdom of what matters the most is not the same thing that matters to people. It is the person who gives from their poverty, gives that last coin. We talked about it before too, about gifts being the first fruits with the idea is that if you have apples. You grow apples and you take and donate the money from the first batch of apples to the church. You are going to count on the fact that there are going to be more apples later. What if it starts hailing? What if we get a cold snap? What if there are no more apples because a giant bug comes along and eats all the apples? You're counting on God with your gift. And that is what the widow is doing. She is giving all she has in knowing that God will care for her that is faith. Jesus then talks about the destruction of the temple, how there's not going to be one stone left on another. To realize, and I've been to Jerusalem, it is a big city. It is a big place. And to to say that this is going to be torn down, and it was, you know, I think it was 69 AD, 70 AD, we'll just round to 70 AD, but it's going to be done in like 40 years from when Jesus is telling them. And people are shocked. The temple was rebuilt by Herod. It had been down for a long time. Herod built it back up. I think it was only five years when this whole temple building project, which Herod never got to see the end of, was up. Yay, we finished. Five years later, the whole thing was down again. This is going to be shocking to everybody. I I just imagine if you said something about One World Trade Center just after it got rebuilt after the World Trade Center in New York, and someone came by and said, it is coming down. People would be shocked, would be hurt, would be scared. I mean, this would be horrifying. And that's not even a place we worship God. It's not supposed to be our connection point to the Lord Almighty. This is the spiritual home to an entire people and a Jerusalem along with it. When he says this, I'm sure people were just beside themselves. And he talks then, too, about a lot of people are going to come in my name. I'm there. I'm here. I am he. That's a reference to I am, meaning that they're going to say they're God. Don't go after them. Don't listen to them. And when you hear wars, tumults, you know, uproars of things, don't be terrified. This has to take place. But the end is not going to be at once. You know, people think of the end of the world as this event and it's over with. It's not going to be an all-at-once thing. But Jesus said in other Gospels that it is going to be cut short so that people don't suffer more. It is not said in Luke's chapter. So again, we're talking about two destructions. The little destruction, which is Jerusalem. In other Gospels, it called it the abomination to come. Something horrible is going to happen. It's not mentioned in Luke, but then we talk about the end destruction, the final thing. And I think he's putting the two together to help us understand what it is. We can't understand the end of the world. I think it's too big for us to understand, but we could understand the destruction of something so important to the people at that time as the city of Jerusalem. This is supposed to be the city of David, the city of God, the place of the temple. It is where people come to worship give their offerings. This is coming down. He's trying to tell them this story in a way they'll get. And Jesus goes on to say, nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Earthquakes, famine, pestilence, oh goodness, and terrors and signs from heaven. I think the thing that struck me out of all this when I was reading it 
is you often had the Assyrians would sack the Phoenicians or the Babylonians would sack the Persians, something like that. It was always one nation taking another nation. At this point on earth, we did not see nations rising up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. To me, this feels like world war, something that didn't happen at the time of Jesus, which I think would be possible to imagine this battle between many nations and these terrors to come. But then he goes on and talks to them. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be thrown into prison. The synagogue is going to persecute you. You're going to be brought to governors and kings. In my sake, now he's talking to the apostles and what's happening with them. This is going to be your opportunity to bear witness. We see that. We're going to see that when we see the early church, where Paul uses his arrest in Rome to talk to the highest levels of society. When you get brought before the court system, this is your microphone, in a sense. We don't think of it that way. We think of persecution. Obviously, we don't want to be persecuted. I remember there was a fellow who was persecuted on television. He lost his life because he was taken captive by a group of people. And he used that message and his last words to say something about Jesus. That message got out to so many people and he used it as an opportunity instead of a a devastation. It's, It's hard to do. I admire his strength at that moment, but Jesus is saying, this is an opportunity to bear witness. Settle it in his mind, but don't think about what you're going to say because I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered even by parents, brothers. Yeah, we saw that in World War II where children were turning in their parents and some of you are going to be put to death. You'll be hated. I mean, he talks about this, but not one hair on your head will perish but your endurance will gain your lives. He's clearly telling them not to be afraid. God is in control. I'm going to tell you what to say. I'm going to help you at those moments. Don't be afraid of this. It's hard to imagine this because I think we do get afraid or maybe even the opposite way where like Peter, which we're going to talk about how Peter betrayed Jesus. You think, oh no. You know, if something like that happened to me, I totally could do that. I'm a strong Christian. I know the right things to say. But you get into that position, you get scared. Jesus is saying, don't get scared. Keep your eyes on me. I will give you the right things to say. And people, they won't be able to contradict it. I will be there with my words. He mentions before the Holy Spirit giving people those words. Then he talks about the coming of the Son of Man. That's him. Should be signs in the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, distressed and in perplexity because the roaring of the seas and the waves, people fainting with fear, oh goodness, and foreboding for what is coming onto the world. This is all ESV, by the way. The power of the heavens will be shaken. Then you will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and glory. And these will take place. Straighten up. Raise your head because your redemption is drawing near. When we see this, we should stand tall because now we know what's going to happen. This is going to be hard for everybody. And again, this is the end end. You know, again, where we're talking about separating the weeds from the wheat. This is going to be where the angels are going to take the people away from this. Can't even imagine this. The sun, the moon, and the stars. We just can't even think about it. And sometimes we worry about when we see things on earth happening with wars and plagues when something like this happens. You understand that when we see things happen, it worries us that this is the end. But Jesus is saying, straighten up, raise your head. This is the redemption drawing near. You're going to remember that, that if it ever happens to us, that's what we're going to do. And then he gives his last parable of the fig tree that is a little bit more simple than the other ones. We've seen the fig tree represent the fruits of effort, bringing people to God, the harvest. In this case, he's saying that when you look at a tree and it starts to leaf out, you know summer is near. 
you know the good time is coming. That means the kingdom of God is near. This is where he said, I truly say to you, this generation will not pass away to all this has taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So generation, this has confused people for ages because I think the apostles thought they were not going to die before the end of the world happened. Someone was mentioning that at a certain point, once they started to get to be older men, that's when the Gospels got written down. I think they thought everything is going to end in our lifetime, so we have time to go and talk and tell everybody. But when they got older, that's when the Gospels got written down because they realized the word has to endure. We are going to die first. So the, clearly, the generation doesn't mean this group of people or what we think of a generation, you know, 25 ish years of people. Or someone even said that a generation was 120 years and had some rationale about this. What we're meaning about this generation is, I think, this phase of mankind. We had phases of mankind before the covenant. We had phases of mankind during the covenants, during captivity, before Jesus comes. Now we have a group of people who are seeing we are in that latter end, right? There's no more phases. The last phase is the end. And it, when he talks about the generations, what I get from most of the commentaries is that's what it means. The people in the generation from after Jesus returns from the dead into his new heavenly body until the end of time. He means this group of people that will exist on earth in this last phase. That is the generation that is going to be there. In the end, there will be people on earth at the very end. They will see Jesus coming in glory as compared to him coming in humility as a baby in Bethlehem. And his word will never pass away. We feel at times that the world is trying to make his word pass away. It's not going to happen. And he tells them to watch yourself that you shouldn't be drunk. You shouldn't look away. Because that day, that end of the world is going to come up like a trap. It's going to be a surprise, I guess, is the best way to say it. And it's going to come for the whole world, everyone who dwells on earth. Stay awake. Pray that you can have strength to escape the things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. He was teaching in the temple, went out and lodged, and he went to the Mount of Olives. And people came back the next morning to hear him. Boy, I think I wouldn't sleep that night. <laughs> that would be me just sitting in my little lodge thinking, what did he just say? This is scary stuff, right? But he is letting us know he is always with us. We have heard Jesus and other gospels talking about watching the bridesmaid who were supposed to wait for the bridegroom and those who were prepared and those who weren't. That we should be like watchmen at the gate looking for the signs. He even came against the scribes and the Pharisees saying, you know the weather. You can tell by looking at the clouds what kind of weather you're going to get, but you don't know the signs of what is coming to pass. Jesus is telling us to stay awake, pray for strength. He is looking out for us to have the courage through prayer to handle what's going to happen next. And that's our scary end to Luke 21. What I'm going to meditate is on the whole end of time and how you can be a witness and a beacon of light and hope to other people at that end of time. How you can be the person who's not shaken, who knows the thing to say, who straightens up, raises your head, and goes and helps other people. Being there for them. Everyone is going to be scared, particularly the people who don't know Jesus at that point. I'm going to think a little bit about that. And what I'm going to pray about is to have that kind of strength to always be watching, always be praying, and to be ready to help other people in case anything like that happens. And what I'm going to share with other people is this idea 
this earth is not forever, that what's happening here is not always going to be the case. We think about, I think, escaping to other planets. We think about what we can do to become computerized. You know, some people are looking at basically trying to download our consciousness into computers. It's not going to happen. This world is not forever. The next kingdom, the kingdom of God, that's forever. And we should just hug and tell people and bring as many people with us that we possibly can. All right, everyone, thanks so much. Thanks for sticking with me on these very scary episodes. I know it's tough and it's tough for me too, um, doing this deep dive into these statements of Jesus. Please remember to tell a friend, have other people who might be interested in this podcast. The Bible and small steps.com is the website for this podcast. And you can find all the episodes of the podcast on the website. You can listen there. If someone doesn't know how to use a podcast app or never has listened to one, they can just listen to it on the website itself. Thanks so much for listening and sweet dreams. Sweet dreams.